Garnia Sassano was not having her best day. In truth, she'd never actually enjoyed preterm, but this was a bit much. Preterm day ostensibly marked the beginning of a wonderful year for the student body. The cream of Chauvanti nobility flocked in to drop off their daughters, enjoy touring the campus facilities, and attend the commencement address, while the evening allowed time to visit old friends while meeting with the faculty. It all sounded like a wonderful time to renew fond memories and make new friends. In practice, it was a necessary evil, where Ganya spent the day wandering the campus calming a frazzled staff who endured being demeaned. Afterward, the faculty was privileged to sit under hot lights for a speech of indeterminable length, before meeting with a flock of nobles all preening for at or over each other. In normal years, it was mostly parents of the fresh women, while older students were often dropped off by family retainers. Unless the keynote speaker was exceptional enough to provide a draw, the usual turnout was perhaps five or six thousand parents. By late afternoon, when the commencement address rolled around, the number could drop to four thousand, with families heading home afterward. For the evening's Meet the Faculty event, the number could easily be half that again, generally covering a range from the keenest parents to the most dedicated alumni. This year, the alumni had booked Admiral Tejo, and by the last count, there were easily 12,000 people wandering about the campus. Marvisti Roche on the alumni committee was beside herself, which foretold a faculty meetup that would border somewhere between insufferable and agonising. At least Roche had thankfully disappeared for now, as it was her habit to attach herself to some noble or other, leveraging her position as alumni chair for all its brief worth. Although she moved through the crowds with aplomb, Garnia was starting to count down the hours. There had been more than enough exploding bombshells to defuse that morning, and it was past time she checked in on matters that seemed suspiciously quiet. After the outburst in the hall, her human professor had quickly restrained himself, and while we there hadn't been able to translate the word fracking, Warwick's self-control hopefully marked the outburst as an isolated situation, rather than a recurring problem. Encouraged, Ganya had taken the chance to sit down with Warwick and explain her plans for him on preterm day. That also went better than expected, and certainly not as badly as she'd feared. Admittedly, Warwick looked thunderous when she asked him to complete the formal greetings with the Admiral after her speech, and she couldn't entirely fault him, but he had heard her out. Yes, she agreed it was literally a piece of pure theatre. Yes, literally meant it was going to be recorded for broadcast, though only for the local news. Yes, he would be seated in the front row besides Mithair, and yes, of course it was to put him on display, because, like it or not, that was sometimes the point. And yes, Warwick was there to teach, but that also meant visibly showing that humans could participate civilly as citizens of the Imperium. Even if her last argument finally gained Warwick's grudging acceptance, it didn't mean Ganya was blissfully unconcerned as she strolled across campus to the Earth exhibit. Tour hours were drawing to a close as she stepped into the gallery, and while she'd heard occasional remarks during the day, there had been too many actual problems to handle to spare attention on something that seemingly wasn't. Duchess Pavasso had taken over half an hour before she was able to break free, just over the size of her daughter's dorm room. That wasn't a woman even she could afford to ignore, even over something so petty. At least she could vent with her family tonight. Garnia was eternally thankful they were used to it by now. The day had given her little more than moments to check on with Aaron and Tom, but at least Velisti did send a few messages that all was going well. With most of her time spent greeting upper nobility parents for the freshman class, that was one less matter to deal with. The head librarian knew the drill, so Garnia tried not to worry, as she finally arrived at the main library. She rounded the entry to the human exposition to find me there deep in conversation with two students, who were flanked in turn by a crowd of hovering parents. Mevere caught her eye before giving her a smile and a nod, which filled the administrator with a measure of relief. 
Ganya had known Mavere since she first joined the academy, and the smile on her face was unforced. Fourth bell, and all was well. Moving closer, she frowned a bit. Tom Warwick was nowhere to be seen, and Ganya cocked her head and spread her hands, questioning Miv silently. It wasn't encouraging if Warwick had fled the exhibit, but in fairness it was his first preterm day, and she'd face far worse dilemmas today than coming an overwrought male. Some of these families had lost co-wives and sisters on earth, and there were worse things than being snubbed by a low turnout. It seemed reasonable, yet Mivere hadn't appeared upset in the least. Garnier waited, her patience rewarded during a lull in the conversation, as Miv craned her head slightly towards the back of the exhibit. Ganya took the hint, their unspoken exchange smooth as a pond on a windless day. It was likely the parents hadn't noticed a thing, which was well and good. It wasn't preterm without some noble's display of wounded ego or self-importance, and this year had been no exception. The day had been exhausting, with the great and the good blithely doing their best to fray the nerves of the entire faculty. It was certainly understandable if Warwick was only taking a break. If anything, the hall seemed quiet. A port in a storm was always welcome. Leaving Mavere behind, she moved towards the back room of the gallery. Standing only six foot three, Ganya wasn't a tall woman, and the rows of displays obscured her sight as she worked her way towards the back of the hall. She stopped short as the doors to the rear gallery opened. Warwick backed out, leading... Ganya stopped counting. The rear gallery took a quarter of the large exhibit hall, but it must have been packed to capacity, as students and parents poured forth like an incoming tide. And yes, Lady Vilexi, I promise we can send more Chuck Berry. Everyone, just this way, please. She had always been at home in large groups. Thanks to her position and her title, which she cherished in that order, she was comfortable dealing with all but the most difficult parents. Still, her mouth nearly fell open as she watched Warwick draw out the teeming crowd. The gathering seemed to manage itself, the jostle of higher nobles setting their precedence with one another, but to her relief, Warwick didn't seem overwhelmed as they called out questions. Ganya struck the post she often thought of as head administrator, watching her staff number two. It was crisp, with just a hint of judgmental prudishness, asserting her control like a general surveying her troops. As she glanced over the crowd, she easily recognised three women in the forefront as wives of House Gelf, trading arch looks with two women in the colours of House Theriel. Meanwhile, Lady Vond, Duchess of House Jalaire, and her daughter took point, while Mavisti Roche hovered just behind. Because of course that's where you've gotten yourself off to, Ganya thought darkly, as Vond moved forward. So, Professor Varric, what other duties will you have besides teaching about humanity? After seeing this collection, I'm convinced I should put a regional office on your world, and I want my daughter to learn all she can. Warwick nodded thoughtfully before replying, I'm sure humanity will be all the better for your consideration, lady. Uh, to answer your questions, though, my class with Professor Pelavon runs three days a week, and I've been assigned one extracurricular study by the head administrator. Of course I'm excited to be here, and I hope to see something of your world during Shell and the holidays, but I expect my first year will mostly keep me firmly stuck on campus. I can't understate what an adjustment being on Shell is. Ganya fell that away, as she'd begun to suspect Warwick had a way with a double entendre, but an invitation from the Jalairs might be something he couldn't escape. As the women all nodded and cooed with kindness, and basked in the warm glow of validated condescension, she slipped a hand over Tom's shoulder. Ladies, I'm terribly sorry to steal the professor away from you. We're just finishing the tours and getting ready for the commencement address, but I won't keep him for more than a moment. Warwick took the hint, moving back from the crowd. Conversation from the tour group fell away to an animated sorceress, as she drew him to the music exhibit. The native songs, all that was needed to conceal their conversation. All right then, just keep smiling and tell me how you're getting on, Professor. 
Well, it's outside my area. So Professor Pelavon has been handling questions from parents, hoping to get their other children admitted. Warwick didn't look back, and waved amiably over to Mivere. That sounds like an excellent plan, but I admit I'm surprised. Not to look away from a gift freely given, but you're telling me the whole afternoon has all gone this smoothly? Well, no. There have been one or two parents who looked like they wanted to kill me on sight. I've had my name mangled in ways I didn't think possible. Been asked if I was part of the exhibit six times. Invited to visit some woman's home 23, he said, glancing back toward the tour group. And had my ass pinched 42 times as soon as the gallery lights went down, but hey, who's counting? Ganya nodded indulgently, and gave another smile for the crowd's benefit. This should be the last tour, and I'll get a tube of bruise cream sent over before the commencement speech. You appear to be dealing well? Hmm. Well, most of the tours have gone fine, but if looks could kill with that bunch behind me, you need a fire hose to get all the blood off the walls. Perhaps, but that's not your fault. House Gelf and House Frail don't get on. But I wouldn't worry unless the hairpins come out. You're kidding, right? Welcome to higher education, Professor Warwick. Now, don't keep them waiting. Trust me, they don't like waiting. Admiral Arali Tejo was not having a good day. It began with an anonymous message. Admiral Tejo, I am with the interior. There is no cause for alarm. A human is on the academy faculty and under close surveillance. He is unarmed and you are completely secure. The message left her in a cold sweat and feeling anything but secure. In fairness, the Admiral knew her strengths and weaknesses. While she wasn't a coward, neither was she particularly brave. Under her first command, she was fortunate, as the only surviving captain in a minor victory. Spurned on by that brush of mortality, she'd ruthlessly used the prestige of victory and her house to parlay her way into ever larger commands, winning subsequent battles through the reasonably safe, uninspired but time-tested method of bringing overwhelming force down on any problem. If Arane's tactical skills failed to win the accolades of her peers, it didn't bother her in the least. Certainly, it hadn't prevented her from manoeuvring into a plum assignment on the logistics and planning staff for conquest of an industrial world named Earth. Aurelie had every expectation the liberation would go smoothly, and with her time in service, she could retire after a year's tour. Large conquests were rare, and because Aurelie knew an opportunity when she saw it, her secretary had already lined up a talented ghostwriter with a reputation for being discreet. Getting home to Shill before any of the other staff will let her steal a march on those other bitches and get her name in front of the public eye. Her money hadn't been wasted, and she'd reap rewards from the Empress herself. Still, the accolades couldn't erase her memory of the hellish years she'd spent on Earth. Despite the liberation success, red zones blossomed across the planet like wildfires, and she'd survived two assassination attempts by nothing more than sheer luck. Her ghostwriter made a great deal out of Arali's heroism during the second attempt, but the memory still filled her with a visceral horror that drug therapy simply couldn't address. It had taken almost two days for search and rescue teams to find her, and she still woke in the night, tormented by memories of the dreadful silence as she lay trapped under the rubble. The darkness. The terrible thirst as she prayed to the goddess to be found. It wasn't trauma. Arali Teju arrived at the bone-deep conviction that humans would be the death of her, and she'd been happy never to set foot on the cursed planet again. The last two months of her tour were spent guiding fleet support from orbit, and the return to Shill filled her with a profound relief from the nightmares. Her anxiety swelled like an incoming tide at her first sight of the human. He was a male, no less, and if all the women around her were deceived... Arali Tejo knew better. The overhead lighting cast dark shadows on the alien's face, and after she was called to speak, she swore she could feel his eyes boring into her back. A sea of nobility was seated before her as she strode to the podium, 
with at least a dozen major houses in the front rows alone. The security on site was impressive. There was an agent's assurance the human was unarmed. Everything should be fine, but she was haunted by the memory of her close escapes. The overhead light stabbed down as she accepted the applause, and she focused her thoughts just as trauma therapy had taught her. But goddess, it felt so hot. Aureli knew the speech had to look effortless, and the pressure of that only made it worse. If nothing else, the damn thing was being recorded for the local news. But for the human, it would have been tempting to stay for the evening, and talk to those nobles who met her approval. Now all she had to do was give the speech, smile for the crowd, greet the barbarian, and leave as fast as her dignity allowed. She tried to work past her fear and launched into her remarks, but the male had ruined everything. She swore she could feel the savage's eyes on her back like knives. But the true heroines are the women standing out there in these very moments, taking the worst that our enemies can give. They are the true peacekeepers guarding our borders while bringing the gift of civilization to the worlds within. And so I urge this class to help the Imperium press forward with two things we must do. Two things we shall do. First, never waver. Never allow our enemies to imagine we will, for I can assure you we will not. Second, endure through your every trial, because with the full blessings of the Imperium, we are going to prevail. In Tom's opinion, the climax of Admiral Tejo's harangue had probably been the best part. The bulk of it had been a study in Pompa's self-congratulation, and while the illusions over the liberation of Earth had been grating, it was the length that had been appalling. The first half seemed to go down well with the parents, but as Tejo rolled past 45 minutes with no end in sight, he noticed the audience was beginning to fidget. Sitting next to Miver, Tom had ample time to look over the crowd. He moved little, as if willing away any residual attention from the audience. It helped that the Admiral was doing her best to soak up the limelight like a black hole, and if parts of the speech set his teeth grinding like tectonic plates, at least no one could see. Shill was hot, and the theatre was hotter, thanks to the packed crowd. The overhead lighting spearing down turned the stage into an oven. If not for the calling tech in his school uniform, Tom knew he probably wouldn't have made it, but Tejo had managed to turn the evening into a gruelling test of endurance. He clapped as the ordeal came to an end. Five claps, no more, no less. Enough for the look of the thing. As applause from the audience washed over the stage, Tom wondered if the crowd applauded from approval or relief before deciding he just didn't care. Trapped in the moment, the one thing he cared about was Ganya's request that he present the Academy's honorarium to the Admiral. He hadn't cared for Teju after reading her book, but any lingering doubts had completely vanished during her speech. The Admiral stood off to one side as the head administrator took to the podium. I want to thank the Admiral for her stirring remarks to our student body and for her time to address everyone this evening. Polite applause drifted up to the stage once more, and he watched as Ganya waited for it to pass. As Ganya carried on with her remarks, Tom looked over at the Admiral and studied her back. Tom knew Tejo hadn't held a position with intelligence. There was no chance whatsoever the woman had been involved with target selection. If she had, Tom wasn't entirely sure what he'd have done about it, though some ugly thoughts had crossed his mind. Regardless, this was his moment, and he was there to push humanity forward. He listened to the head administrator, and he waited for his cue to stand. The whole situation made him feel sick, but he knew what he had to do. And as many of you have learned today, we have a special addition to our faculty this year. As the first human professor for Empress Zarika's Academy for Young Ladies, I'd like to draw your attention to Professor Thomas Warwick, as he greets the Admiral and presents her award as this year's commencement speaker. 
He felt himself rise like an automaton and walked forward, holding up the heavy crystal award for view. He didn't normally consider himself a violent man, but as he hefted the trophy, it struck him how the thing would make an outstanding blunt object for causing grievous bodily harm. Instead, he let it go, smiling for the crowd with a nod to Ganya, and at her nod of consent, Tom made a sharp right face and walked over to look up at the Admiral. Good evening, Admiral. On behalf of Empress Zarika's Academy for Young Ladies, it is my honour to present you with this token of our esteem and my personal greetings. Teju placed her hands on the award around Tom's, but rather than face the crowd for the camera, she stared at him like he was about to grow horns. Frankly, he didn't give a damn. He knew what he had to say. Once that was done, nothing else would matter. He was far enough from the podium to say his piece, and it would only take a moment. My name is Thomas Warwick. I am from Indianapolis, on the planet Earth. Tom saw Tejo's eyes bulge at that. Good, you bitch. You know what that means. And there's only one thing I wanted to say to you. Deep within the surveillance bunker, Captain Sitar rocketed from her chair as the crowd gasped in alarm. She looked over at Sergeant Rolan, who held up her hand. She's alive, Captain. Sensors show a heartbeat. She... she fainted. Sitar sat down on the comm button hard, as six Death's Head commandos waited for orders, yelling, Do not take the shot! Pause one and two confirm. Maintain cover and do not take the shot. Seated with the other professors from the music department, Special Agent of the Interior, Lamana Duvari, couldn't hear what the humans said, but she was transmitting a message through her Omnipad, seconds after the Admiral dropped like a stone. She'd enjoyed a good view of the entire affair, and if the human had done anything wrong, she couldn't see it. If there was a contact poison involved, Duvari would kill him later, but since one of her team had checked the area for toxins, the chances seemed astronomically thin. She'd been hoping the interminable speech would end after the first 15 minutes, but Lamana couldn't care less about the Admiral. The message to Teju had been her duty, but as long as her objective was safe, anything and anyone else was inconsequential. When the explanation from Surveillance 2 flashed back on her pad, she felt a step of annoyance, and some vocalised her response. I want a transcript of everything said on that stage, and I want it now. The Emerald's eyes rolled in her head before she kneeled over at Tom's feet. Ganya was at their side in moments, assessed the situation and raised her voice. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, gentlemen and ladies, please do not be alarmed. This happens at more events than you'd ever guess. It looks like the heat has gotten to the Admiral. I assure you that everything is fine. Thankfully, her ladyship, Mitroness Sarali Tejo, Admiral of the Purple, picked that moment to snore. <laughs>